Mr. Chapman. Okay, two things I want to make sure I mention before we get into the lecture. Um, thing number one on problem 3A of the homework, Q sub E is equal to minus E. It's a negative value for that problem because it makes a difference on your answer, whether it's negative or positive. So I, you know, if you feel that you answered right based on thinking that QE would be like E in just a magnitude, let me know and I'll update your score appropriately. Um, the second thing, the second thing was I wanted to make a statement about perusal because in the course evaluations, one person said, you know, added nothing. And I want to make sure people understand, yes, we're still doing it because pedagogically it is very sound. It covers three bases. Number one is it is a way to make sure that the students actually have done their part in preparing for the lecture. That is, they've looked over the chapter. Number two is it provides community among the students as they communicate with each other and help each other learn. Even though it's anonymous, so you don't necessarily know who you're responding to. It, it is working anonymously now, right? Okay, just want to make sure. Huh? I've been assuming. And number three, it allows me to see the things students have questions about. And honestly, I didn't check nearly as much as I wish I had last semester, but I did periodically check in and might have been able to tell my answers. I don't know. So it has three strong pedagogical reasons for it. Ideally, at least in my mind, it's only taking about 15 minutes per lecture. I was talking to a student and the student uh, said, oh no, it's taking me much longer. And if it is taking you much longer, do talk to me. Just, I want to know how much time things are taking because I don't want to say, oh yeah, you know, I've, I've got planned out exactly how much time I think it's taking people, you know, to study outside of class. And if I'm wrong, I want to know because no teacher should want to have a disproportionate amount of their student study time, right? It's not a goal. Okay, so everybody understand those two things? When what? Yeah, yeah. Word? Word. You didn't say anything, though. I did the first lecture. I said everything's the same. <laughs> Sorry, man. Fortunately, you do have drops. Okay. Moving on. Moving on to Andy. Woo. Okay. Because it's now Physics 152, it's a different URL. And I'll give you a few moments here to, to get on board. At least an hour? Yeah, it's not supposed to. It's just because you have to sit and type so much. Yeah, there's no way. In the syllabus, doesn't say something about like 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. That's not why. Well, it's like if you were going to peruse the material, okay. But like, when you have to comment seven paragraphs worth, yeah. Like, anything that doesn't sound stupid. Oh, okay. I mistook you there for a second. Yes, too. I, I will I will then have to reconsider because I don't want to be sucking time. Yes, Andy? My main issue with perusal is like I can get it done in the 15 minutes, but I don't like get much out of it. And then I don't, I'm less likely to go back and like actually thoroughly read things. Like I'm like, okay, I need to get this out of the way. And then I don't actually well, read the, the theory on what you're accomplishing there is you're skimming over it so that you have an idea of what's going to be covered in class. The, the, the theory is not that you understand it completely, but that you're skimming over it and then you're asking questions about, like, this thing doesn't make sense. Could you just but but if, if you don't come back and read it after skimming over, then... Or maybe you can make it to, like, five comments or something. I don't know, because I feel like sometimes you have to write so much information yeah. on it mm -hmm. to get the full credit, okay. even when, like, your thoughts can be really short and, like, be like, this is my question. But I have to write about it for a uh, like. I have to write two more sentences, or it's going to drain you down. Five sentences <laughs> explaining my one question. So by the time, like time I'm done, I sound like stupid I because I'm like, it. yes, <laughs> like, please answer this okay. question for me. I, I will. To get my I believe I can lower the number of responses, so I'll go and look at that. And I did make it so you now can see your grade instantly. I believe. 
Okay, all but one person is in, and I'm not sure who's not in because, of course, I don't have a roster here, but I'm going to move forward because we can't wait all day. Question just to make sure we have a fundamental – you don't have to have these things memorized, but you're going to use it so much. It's really good to have it in your head. What is the fundamental charge? It's not working. Um, it is now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sarah, Sarah. Oh, <clears throat> I'm, for some reason it stopped allowing answers, but you, you can continue to answer now. Eight of ten have answered, nine of ten have answered, and since the tenth person somehow hasn't connected yet, we'll stop here. Everybody said 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19, except for Sarah trying to get people to say it wrong. It right. <laughs> well, yeah. So that is the fundamental charge. What makes it fundamental? It is the charge of one electron, but that in itself doesn't make it fundamental. And it's the all charges are a multiple of that charge. That's what makes it fundamental. All charges are integer multiples of that. Any positive or negative integer or zero. All right. Moving on to newer material. We had in lab yesterday students that explained a lot of things. And... This is already prepared. I don't want people who did the charge by induction and conduction to feel like I'm picking on them. It didn't matter who was doing it. I was going to review it because it's an important idea to understand. So charging by conduction, you all saw the demonstrations yesterday. What is the fundamental thing that you're doing when you charge by conduction? Contact. Contact. So I rub the, the amber on the fur. And I bring it up here. Now, when I bring it close, things do happen, right? But I haven't transferred charge unless, of course, it arcs a little bit. But when I touch it, I transfer charge. And I don't remember when David was doing this. I don't just leave it like this. Why do I go like this? Because the electrons can't flow, so they're just the one spot on the rubber. So if you right. Have to transfer, you have to touch the part of the rubber. The rubber is an insulator. There is excess charge on the surface of the insulator. In this case, it's missing electrons. And so that charge can't move, but if I move this around, I can pull electrons off of the metal any place where it touches this. And so the more areas I touch, the more charge I'm going to have transferred. So now this was positively charged, meaning it had a missing electrons. I brought it up here. Electrons went from that metal to this, leaving the metal with what kind of charge, positive or negative? Positive because electrons left it. So this is now not as positive, and that's positive. So it gives you the same type of charge. What happens when I put my finger on this? Okay, we say grounds. The, when we say ground in electrical terminology, that really means you connected it to the earth. Of course, I'm not connected to the earth here. I'm standing in rubberized shoes on a floor, blah, blah, blah. So it's not a true ground, but we still use the term ground. But if it was a true ground, and I have this at my house, I have a copper spike that I nailed into the ground, and then I attached a copper wire to that and connected it to, um, well, to where I used to have an antenna and you know that kind of stuff. Why? Because the earth, the ground, has lots and lots and lots of electrons, and lots and lots and lots of protons. And you could add, you know, billions upon billions upon billions of electrons, and the Earth wouldn't care. It just kind of shrug. It would not really change its balance by any perceptible amount. So the Earth can act as a, a sink or a source for electrons. You can easily dump electrons to the Earth. You can easily pull them away. And that's what we mean by grounding something. We connected it to something that, can, that will take away excess electrons, or add electrons if there's missing electrons. My body's not nearly as big as the Earth. I don't have nearly as many, of elect as a as many electrons. But for the purposes of this, 
my body has so much more electrons than the excess this would have or the amount this would be missing that it will just supply or take what's necessary. So that's why my body worked as a gram. Okay, so now we're going to do by induction. What's the key for induction versus conduction? Proximity instead of contact. Now, we're not going to get to electric fields today. Well, we'll we probably will do one problem. But when I bring this close, because this is positive, it is trying to attract electrons. So the electrons in this metal are being attracted more to the place close to where this is and less to the place far from it. Now, if I bring this close and I touch this with my <laughs> finger, it will pull electrons from my finger because this is trying to pull electrons. So electrons from my finger went onto that apparatus and I take this away. And because it pulled electrons from my finger onto it to try to respond to this, it now has excess electrons trapped on it. So induction makes the opposite sign of charge. This charge didn't change at all, but this one has the opposite sign. Whereas conduction, it transferred charge, this one went down, and that one went to be the same sign as this was. So I want to make sure I covered that carefully. The other stuff is also important, like, you know, understanding lightning and that kind of stuff, also important. But this one here was the biggest thing. So this picture here is showing charging by contact or conduction. And then here is the, uh, the much more sophisticated pictures for charging by induction. You notice instead of a person touches, they actually connect it to this symbol right here, which I'll just draw a bigger version of it. That means you've connected it to the earth. So that, that's the ground symbol. And you'll find some other symbols like this here. That means you connect it to a common reference point that's not a spike into the ground. So you'll see some variations on grounding. We tend to think of these as the same, but technically there is a difference. The one with those lines means it's connected into the earth. All right, moving forward. A practical example of what we have already learned. Now, we've only been in this one day, one lab. We've learned enough to understand how a photocopier works. How many people have wondered how a photocopier works? Thank you, Claudia. To me, this is really cool. So the photocopier starts with, oh, I'm in PowerPoint. I can't just zoom in like, well, I can zoom, but not very well. Yeah, let's not try it. It starts with passing paper under a bar that is going to pull electrons off of the paper. Now, it's paper conductor and insulator. Can charge freely move across the paper. It's an insulator. So the charge isn't going to move around, but you can still pull electrons off. So that bar there is pulling electrons off of the paper, making it positively charged. Then you come to the complex thing. We'll start with the drum, this drum here. The drum you'll see is selenium coated. Selenium, well, that's just an element, right? But it's an element with a cool property, photoconductivity. If you have it with light shining on it, it will conduct. But if you don't have light shining on it, it won't. So it is, you see, once again, there's an electrode that puts positive charge along that selenium surface. But you have a grounded um, metal drum in the middle. And then you shine light, and wherever you shine light, it conducts. So what happens to the places where you shine light? After you put a pot put a positive charge, that means you take away electrons. If you shine light and the selenium becomes conducting, what's going to happen? Then the electrons are going to be pulled up, replacing the, the missing electrons so it's neutral. And so your drum is then only going to be charged in the places where you did not shine light. And then that drum rolls around and it comes to the toner. The toner is what we think of as ink. It's a powder that is given a negative charge. 
And so you have the positive charge comes by and you have the negative charge powder. If you have positive and negative, what kind of force do you have between them? You have what kind? Positive and negative, you have attractive. attractive. You have an attractive force. So the toner is going to stick to that selenium drum only on the places that light did not shine because that's still positive. And then the paper goes underneath and you just crush that toner onto the paper. And the paper is more positive than the um, drum. And so the negative toner is attracted to the paper and then you crush it in. And so that transfers the toner to the paper. If you have ever had a mishap with a copy machine and you take the paper out before <laughs> the end, have you noticed what happens? It's all smeary. The last step is, it says, the fuser. That toner is like plasticky. And you heat it up and it melts. And so the fuser melts the toner into the paper so it won't be smeary, so it'll be stuck in place. That's why the paper comes out of the hot copy machine hot, because it had to go through that fuser as the last step to make sure the toner stays there. It's not super sophisticated. At the same time, I wouldn't have come up with it, right? <laughs> it takes a pretty smart person to come up with this kind of apparatus, but you can understand how it works based on what we already have learned. Question, Sarah? How do they get into like print really intricate things? Like even a letter, like how do they get it to be that accurate? Um, they, first of all, the optics. You have to, um, <clears throat> you, you can kind of see the optics here. You have a light that goes across, and then you focus the light on the drum, and it has to be focused very precisely so that you have the charge very precisely laid out. And then if you have that charge precisely laid out, then the toner is precisely laid out and you get that precision. Anyway, I think it's very cool to be able to understand stuff using physics. Coulomb's law. I introduced Coulomb's law as like the last slide in class on Monday. Coulomb's law is the law that says, and I'll rewrite the equation here, the force magnitude, so I'm not putting a vector sign, is K times the magnitude of charge 1 times the magnitude of charge 2 divided by the separation of the charges squared. That's Coulomb's law. Important things to note is the force is proportional to the magnitude of the first charge multiplied by the magnitude of the second charge. So the force doesn't tell you what the two charges are. It's just telling you about the product of the two. I put the absolute value signs because I treat directions separately. I use the rule of opposites attract, likes repel for directionality. So I use the magnitude equation and then lights uh, repel opposite subtract. It's an inverse square law. So if I double the space between charges, what's going to happen to the force? It's going to be one fourth as big. So that's the law. Something that says up at the top, technically this law only applies to point charges, <laughs> charges that occur at a point with no volume. In practice, if my charge is my fist, that's not a point, right? But if it was, let's say, um, Jenna, who's measuring, my fist might as well be a point because it's so far away compared to the size. So anything can be approximated as a point if you're far enough away compared to its size. Second, through Newton's synthesis, we have a rule, and right now I'm just giving it to you as a rule. You're not going to do the calculus unless you're named David. No. <laughs> if you have a spherically symmetric charge distribution, if you're outside of that sphere, the force will act as if it's a point charge at the center of the sphere. So if you have a spherically symmetric charge distribution, even if you're close to it, it will still behave like a point charge at the center of the sphere. So those are justifications for why we use this law so, so much everywhere, even though point charges by definition can't really exist. 
Although I, an electron may be a point charge, but going on. So here I have the equation written out again. And K, this constant, I did not give you a number. I said it's like, you know, 8.9 something in class. And, and that's where we ended. That was like the last thing I think I said. So K has a value of 8.9876 times 10 to the 9 newtons per cool or newtons times meter per coulomb squared. It's actually based on a fundamental constant that epsilon zero is called the permittivity of free space. It's a fundamental constant. And K is one over four pi times that fundamental constant. In a week or so, we will have something else that references that constant and we can see how it comes. But for our class here for physics 152, we're just always going to use this K. Sometimes we put a K with a subscript like E to tell us it's the Coulomb constant that deals with electric charge. We'll just use that because it's less writing than putting one over four pi epsilon zero. <laughs> yes, Sarah laughs, but we physicists, we really do value making things simpler because they're already complex enough. You all agree with that, right? They're complex enough. So what we want to do is learn how to use this. So when we're doing problems involving the Coulombic force, we've already learned a lot about forces. That's what we did first semester for the first half at least. So first we have to be aware of our units. K, the value I gave you for K, 8.9876 times 10 to the 9, is in SI units, in newtons, meters, coulombs, and kilograms. So make sure you convert your charges into SI units as well. I told you in class Monday, we're often going to see microcoulombs or nanocoulombs or rarely millicoulombs. Convert them into coulombs so you don't have an answer that's off by you know 10 to the sixth or something. So that's our first step. Next, when finding the electric force on a single charge due to two or more just calculate the force that you have from each individual charge and then add them up as vectors. Just like you would with gravity. If I have a ball and there's another ball here and a ball here, there's gravitational attraction between this ball and that one, as well as this ball and this one. I just calculate each attraction separately and then add them as vectors. And then I think this is my final one. If several charges are in a line, so for instance, if you have, here is Q1, here's Q2, here's Q3, and you want to find the force on Q1 due to the other two, don't worry that there's a charge in between Q1 and Q3. It's not going to make the answer different. You just do the same rule that we had before, find charge force between Q1 and Q2, Find the force between Q1 and Q3, add them as vectors. Any questions about these rules? Can you go up the first one? Or two? Or two. Yeah. Okay, first one, units. Second one is you add up the individual forces and then add them as vectors to find the net force. Add individual forces. As vectors. As vectors is really important, right? Okay. So I have a couple examples. I'm going to work this first one. You're going to work the second one. So the first one, two styrofoam, and I'm going to ask you the questions A and B because those are not calculation. Two styrofoam balls of mass 10 grams are suspended by threads of length 25 centimeters. So we have 25 centimeters here and 25 centimeters there. The balls are charged. We don't know what their charges are. After which they hang apart, each at an angle of 15.0 degrees from vertical. So there we have the angles. Question number one. What can you tell me about the signs of the charge? Are they the same or are they opposite or do we not have enough information to know? 
Okay, Maxwell says the same. Why do you say the same, Max? Because they're being repelled, right? That rule was pretty simple. If they're the same charge, it's going to repel. If they're opposite charges, it's going to attract. Because they're being pulled apart, pulled apart, pushed apart, we know they have the same charge. They could be both positive or they could be both negative. We don't have that kind of knowledge. But we know they have to have the same charge. Question B. Are the magnitudes of the charges necessarily the same? That is, is charge one equal to charge two? Or could charge one be two times charge two? Wouldn't they be the same because they're both for two degrees apart from one another and 25 degrees exactly? The answer is no, but that's why I asked the question. You tend to think that the force is proportional to the charge, right? but it's proportional to the product of the two charges. So they don't have to be the same. Now for step three, I'm going to restrict myself to if they are the same, because there's an infinite number of answers you would get until you set some relationship between the two. So the reason it's not is because the product isn't necessarily the... The, the product is what the force depends on, not the individual charges. So now the final thing, Find the net charge on each ball, assuming that the charges are equal. So I put this assuming that the charges are equal so I can do it. So here I have my physical layout. And, you know, let's say I just gave you this as a homework problem. What would the first thing that goes through your mind to see besides, oh, no, me? Okay. They're repelling from each other. What kind of problem is this fundamentally? It's a force problem. If it's a force problem, okay, we draw a, draw a diagram and then we draw a free body diagram. This picture actually already shows the free body diagram. Why do we draw the free body diagram? So we can use those forces in. Newton's second law. Right? We got to go back to these force ideas we had before. We draw the free body diagram for the sole purpose of applying Newton's second law. And then we break into components. We have to define coordinate directions. In this case, Newton's second law, sum of the force vectors equals ma vector. What is the acceleration in this case? These balls are staying fixed at 15 degrees. So there's no acceleration. If there's no acceleration, then when I add up my forces, I have three forces. Three makes a triangle. That's the special case where I do it geometrically instead of breaking them into components. You could break them into components and do it correctly. But because it's only three things in my equation, I'm going to do it graphically. So I'm going to apply Newton's second law graphically. So I'm going to have the force of gravity, which is equal to mg, plus the, nice, go away. The force of electrostatic force I'm going to draw this again, even though it probably will come back. And then my final force was tension. So there I've drawn the sum of the forces equals zero. But we know some angles on this, so I'm going to add in those angles, lest we forget. The electric force is going to be repulsive, so it's horizontal. And the gravitational force is vertical. And then this angle here is theta. Two questions. First question. Why did I draw the free body diagram for just one ball? Okay. It is 
symmetrical so it's equal on both sides. But when you apply Newton's second law, you need to choose your object. And so I chose just one of these objects. And so that I only did the forces on that one object. And of course, an ill choice, you might end up with something not solvable. This, this was the right choice. <laughs> How would you go from here? Once I have this triangle, there, there is a really slick way. Does anyone see a really slick way to find the relationship between force of gravity and the force due to electrostatic charge? If you look at the triangle, which side is the force electrostatic? Not the hypotenuse. Tension is the hypotenuse. It's the opposite. The tension is opposite to the right angle, so that's what defines hypotenuse is opposite to the right angle. So that's the opposite side. Which side is the force of gravity? Adjacent side. What trig function relates those two? So what we have is tangent of theta is equal to the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. So because Q1 equals Q2, I just change Q1 times Q2 to Q squared. Uh, that's the top <laughs> divided by mg. There we go. So now I have an equation that says tangent theta is equal to k q squared over r squared mg. Right? And so to solve that for charge, q is equal to plus or minus square root. Remember when you do a square root that introduces two signs. Divide by R and then divide it by yeah, three. because Fe was, this side here was Fe. Uh, so there's my equation for Q. R squared, do I know what R is? I can calculate it though. Because I know that this side here is 25.0 centimeters. And this side here is R over 2. And so R over 2 is opposite. Sine theta is equal to R over 2, the opposite side, divided by the hypotenuse. So R is equal to 50.0 centimeters times sine of theta. That's just solving this equation for R. <clears throat> and so getting to my final answer, and I'm not going to put in numbers because you know what? By this time, I think you all are experienced enough with symbols to know if I have it all in symbols, it's just putting it in the calculator to get the number. Okay, so I am putting the numbers. I'm running out of space. Sine squared theta times tangent theta because I ran out of space. I'm so sorry, I can't fit those in. And then all divided by...
So, <laughs> I ran out of space, so I used S theta and T theta for sine theta and tangent theta. So, and my 9.80 looks suspiciously like 9.86. Oh, times 0 0.010 kilograms. I don't, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's because I initially wrote my square root ending there. That it, if I erase that, it's going to erase the first half of the square root side. There. It's 50 centimeters, yeah. Um, so I should have made that 0 0.500 meters, right? Because you want it to be in SI units. The, the sign, this here is the sign. It's got a square, so I should put sine squared. To, so that's that's the sine squared theta there, squared because it was r squared. I just, I can't. What, what was your uh, what was your question? Um, why put it at the end? Because I want to put my trig functions at the end. It's random choice. Right, so this is sine squared theta times tangent theta at the end. Or if you really wanted, you could have put times sine cubed theta over cosine theta. Now, in doing this, it wasn't actually more difficult than what we did first semester. It's just making you go back to what we did first semester with a new equation for force. So this is all concepts, ideas, things that you've done, except for a new equation for force. So just to review what I did, I drew a diagram, what was given. Then I did a free body diagram, which conveniently enough was given, for my object. I had to identify what my object was. That is an important part of the process. Then I have the free body diagram because I'm going to apply Newton's second law. In this case, because my forces only came up to a three in the equation, I used the triangle. They come up to four or more, I would have had to break each force into its components and then add the x components and separately add the y components and work it through that way. And then, then I applied trick after that in math. So any questions about how I did this problem? Um, the same methods, okay. yes. Generally, yeah. Okay. I mean, you can make seven charges, but what's the point? You're just making it harder for the student, but not testing if they understand it. Better. So generally, you're going to have, you might have a square with a charge at the center. It would make it a little harder, but... Generally, yeah. Maxwell. So you just assume that Q1 and Q2, right? That was given. Oh, I that, that was given in the problem because otherwise I can't solve it. But it could also not be. Right. It could have been like Q1 is one half of Q2, but you have to have some fixed relationship between the two or you have an infinite number of answers. Got it. Okay. Now problem for your individual tables. What's the net force on the top charge? So you're trying to find the net force on this charge. And I'm sure Andy's going to come back, but Max wants you to work with Diana for now. That's very done. <laughs> no, Andy doesn't come back before you're done. You guys got something to work with.
I'm not sure you mean by two of these are straight lines. Honestly, I don't think it matters because it's just the absolute value of the two. It is going to set up the shortest distance so between the two points of the straight So it, whenever you use this, of course, it's always a straight line. Because you're just taking the distance between the two. So, guys, one of these, I'm plugging in. Okay. So to process it, you do one force, do the other force, and then add the inspectors. So you have this pair, and so you find the force between these two based on that distance. And you have this pair, and you find the force between these based on that distance. You don't do this one because you only have the forces on this, and that's between these two. So and then you add those other pieces. It's not I feel like stack number one of my Right. Okay. So I mean, R is the radius between the two, the distance between the two. So, like, for the number of the that's the from point zero to which is what we think. Um, and the so you get square and cross it is weak, so you get square and square. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know that. Yeah. 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 So, on the square, we call it a square. The other one is the Yeah. 
I got point six seven four percent. Okay, I don't think anyone has had time to finish it now, but you've all had time to determine how to do it, right? I've heard a lot of of correct comments. So let me just talk about the solution here in our final two minutes. So if you made a mistake along the way, you can see that where that occurred. So the first thing is I have this charge. What forces act on it? So how many charges are going to cause a force on the 0 0.80 microcoulomb charge? Okay, both two. The other two remaining between the one below, what direction is that force? Is it attractive or repulsive? Attractive, so that means it's down. So I'm going to have force, I'll just call that force one. And that's going to be K times my 0 0.80 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs times 0 0.60 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Why didn't I put the minus sign? Because I'm doing absolute value, just find the magnitude. Divide it by the separation squared of 0 0.080 meters. That's that force. So I just find the magnitude, and I have the direction indicated with my arrow. Now, between the 1 microcoulomb and the 0.8, is it attractive or repulsive? It's repulsive. So there I'm going to have a force like this, I'll call it force two. And that's going to be K times again, my point, come on, 0 0.80 times 10 to the minus six coulombs. And now it's 1.0 times 10 to the minus six coulombs for the other one. Divide by that separation square, which is 0 0.10 meters squared. That's that force. So, of course, you can put those in your calculator and get numbers. K being 8.9876 times to the ninth Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. But then I still have these two forces. I have a force like this and a force like this. How do I find the resultant? Add up your vectors. I add my vector. So I have to do something like break into components, right? And so now comes the... That's why we have the X and Y defined for this problem. So I take these and I have my force one vector is equal to force one in the minus Y hat direction. Minus Y hat means, since Y was up, it means down. Force two vector is force two. And then I have to break it into components. And so it's going to be in the positive y direction but the negative x if i define this for some random reason as theta then the x direction would be minus sine theta and the y direction cosine theta where we can find theta by you know we have the two sides there tangent theta, or not tangent theta, cosine theta is equal to 8.0 centimeters over 10.0 centimeters. So that's how we can get our angle. And then I have to add the X components together and the Y's comp Y components separately, and I have my answer. We are out of time, so we will stop at this point. What's your, what's your question, Anna? Like the side of the, like, negative and positive, like, what the thing is using the flat theorem, and then just do, like, the force on, like, the y component and the x component, like, would it actually add those together and get the same thing? You have to use the separation of the 10 centimeters. 
you can't you can't say it's eight centimeters in the y direction and six centimeters in the x direction. You won't get the right answer to do that because you have to be divided by the actual radius squared. Yeah. Um, on Moodle, it says that there's like a lab thing here. There's nothing new. Um, that's right, because you, you had to train on it. Yeah. You had to train on it. Moodle's like a new like, grading assignment thing. Like a like, grade, grade level or something. Yeah. Yeah. What? You sent like an email to us. Like, grade, grade oh, scope. that's because I added you to grade scope because that's where we do the grade. Okay, what? what, what? The, the grade scope is a website that makes it easy for TAs to grade assignments. And so all of you are in my grade scope class so we can grade your papers. So you don't have to do anything in there. It just told you when I added you. You can go there and you can see the grading there as well. But I, I upload them all to Moodle after you go there. So we don't need to like make, kind of make a password? No, no, no. You're never going to have to do anything there. If you want to see, ooh, is it great yet and not transfer to move, then you can go. Yeah. That, that's the only thing you can do there the way I'm using it. It, it is possible to set up so students upload their assignments there, but it's better to have one interface if you can. Oh, and I better stop my recording.